All right, cool. So let's continue this Baudrillard train uh, with the illusion of the end. So this is when it starts to get really uh, kind of aphoristic, where each of his, each of the essays presented in this text don't necessarily build off of one another in a very uh, teleological or linear way, but they are, you know, all speaking to the same phenomenon, notably simulation, um, the coming of the year 2000, you know, and a, and a number of other things. So I'm going to go through each one of them methodically, slowly, uh, and try to, you know, really expound upon the coherent thread through them all. So the first section titled Pataphysics of the Year 2000, at least in my version, I don't know if there, there are other translations of it that have different translations, uh, but that's what I have here. This is a video of this can actually be found or a similar talk uh, on YouTube called The Year 2000 Will Not Take Place, which Baudrillard gave in the 80s at some point. This has a different title though, Pataphysics of the Year 2000, which is uh, interesting. There's an interesting distinction. So for those that aren't familiar, pataphysics is what is called the science of imaginary solutions. It's kind of a mock form of science that doesn't totally subscribe to the, um, I guess, r rationalized assumptions often associated with science, but is rather embedded with a, within a kind of uh, fantastical domain of science. While the other title, The Year 2000 Will Not Take Place, is certainly playing off Baudrillard's other work pertaining to the Gulf War and how that, that never took place, ostensibly. So, with that being said, let's jump into it. So Baudrillard tells us, almost right off the bat, um, staying with this image, one might suppose that the acceleration of modernity, of technology, events and media, of all exchanges, eco economic, political, and sexual, has propelled us to escape velocity, with the result that we have flown free of the referential sphere of the real end of history. So this is speaking to third, perhaps even fourth degree simulation, or the fourth levels of simulation, because they are the movement beyond the what he calls the referential sphere, that is the Earth. So our pr propulsion into space, into an abyss of sorts. Now this happens because in his speaking about speed, which is very much in tune with um, how Paul Virilio brings it up, and, and in many interviews, uh, Baudrillard refers to, you know, his good friend Paul Virilio or his friend Paul Virilio. Uh, so there's that kind of idea here. But speed, in the way that Baudrillard talks about it, really has to deal with proliferation and what he calls the kind of explosion of discourse and explosion of desire and explosion of whatever you like. Now this comes down to every single political domain where there are not limits to anything anymore. You see the entrance of the of trans capital, of tra the trans political, of the um, like a trans social, anything like that, that marks a general circumvention of all limits, a sort of totalizing deterritorialization. So this signals a moving beyond what he has called in the past in texts like Symbolic Exchange and Death and, and others, uh, second degree simulation, which is where reality really had its uh, go of things. Now, this was the age of class struggle, of the unconscious, of critical theory, stuff like that, that all were able to, uh, I guess, communicate or speak to a cultural phenomena, right? So the total loss of referentiality had not occurred yet. So he says that, at least in how he characterizes that space in this book, he says, a degree of slowness, that is, a certain speed, but not too much, a degree of distance, but not too much, and a degree of liberation, but not too much, are needed to bring about the kind of condensation or significant crystallization of events we call history, the kind of coherent unfolding of causes and effects we call reality. So reality exists only when all of these different kind of cultural phenomena are able to take place, but still within the parameters of a given kind of axiomatic um, structuration right, where they are not allowed to proliferate endlessly. There are rules and, and guidelines. Now, I think that it's important for me to intervene here and say that it, ultimately I think that Baudrillard is ambivalent about how he feels about this, right? Because he doesn't want to applaud a kind of pre-Baudrillard 
simulated era because that would simply reinscribe the idea of there having been some reality at some point. And that, with enough kind of analytic or theoretical rigor, we can uncover and we can uh, pause it as a possibility. So, well, what does that mean for people like us? You know, people who think about theory, people who think about the world. Uh, if we've moved beyond reality, where things like critical theory would have existed, at least that's his argument in Symbolic Exchange and Death. Um, he says that theory has a new purpose, and that is as follows. Theory, theory is not in a position to reflect on anything. It can only tear concepts from their critical zone of reference and force them beyond a, a point of no return a process whereby it loses all objective validity but gains substantially in real affinity with the present system. So it has to, in a sense, speed up to catch the logic of the system or to match the logic of the system. Now, this is one thing that I think that some people have misunderstood, and they see in Baudrillard a kind of left accelerationism, where that is not the case. If anything were to accelerate for Baudrillard, it would be the means by which or our ability to gauge the system itself. So we don't want the system to go faster. We want to find a way to uh, craft a kind of theoretical framework to evaluate that speedy system. So we have in this very process moved beyond what he says is, well, science fiction. Science fiction is not necessary anymore because that would posit some kind of possibility for the future when, for him, all we have to do is look at the present. Now, I think that that's one of the reasons why we are certainly fascinated culturally with some, well, not all of this, but, you know, I'm just speaking generally in very vague, reductive terms. Uh, people are obsessed with certain things like Black Mirror or other kind of uh, apocalyptic, prophetic concerns for the future, precisely because they convince us that these things are not happening yet, right? This, this is a to come. It's always a to come which I think is just one strategy we employ to convince ourselves that we are not currently living that system or living that life, or that life did not occur, hasn't already occurred 30, 40, 50 years ago. So all of this relates to the topic of the end from the title of the book, you know, the, uh, the illusion of the end, precisely because that, ent or that brings in a problem of history that Baudrillard is really trying to sift out in this essay as well. So he says that deep down, one cannot even speak of the end of history, right? That is the illusion of the end. Since history will not have time to catch up with its own end, its effects are accelerating, but its meaning is slowing inexorably. It will eventually come to a stop and be extinguished like light and time in the vicinity of an infinite, infinitely dense mass. So history is threatened in the age of the news. History is threatened in the age of podcasts, history is threatened in the age of anything like that, that make it present. It no longer is history in the moment that it is, you know, present, to put it quite um, vulgarly. So, as he says, right at the very heart of news, history threatens to disappear. At the heart of hi-fi, music threatens to disappear. At the heart of experimentation, the object of science threatens to disappear. At the heart of pornography, sexuality threatens to disappear. Everywhere we find the same stereophonic effects, the same effect of absolute proximity to the real, the same effect of simulation. But then he is clear that there is no such way, or there is no way to go back to a kind of pre-hi-fi music age, a pre-news history age, because it has already become our ontology. That is because with the news, history becomes perfect. With hi-fi, music becomes perfect. With pornography, sexuality becomes perfect. It does away with the messiness. It does away with the ambiguity in favor of an always already present. So this is another key concept or another key idea in his work and something that I expounded upon in some other videos. But for Baudrillard, simulation is can take on two forms. As I have just been describing the advent of hi-fi or the news or pornography, these represent what Baudrillard has called in another text uh, non-contradictory simulation. So they correspond to the degree of simulation that makes everything perfect, that makes everything recognizable, that makes everything consumable, that makes everything neat. Whereas in opposition to that, there is what he calls conflictual simulation. 
Now that is the simulation that is always already there. That is the simulation that comes with the advent of language in any form. That's the simulation that arrives in a kind of phenomenological sense where you never have a relationship with anything in its physicality, but rather with its appearance. So in that way, it's important to keep this distinction in mind. So when Baudrillard is talking about simulation, it's important to know which kind of simulation he's talking about. So here he's talking about the former, that is the oppressive one. And this gives him the possibility to say the following. We are leave, leaving history to move into the realm of simulation. That is because history itself has always been, deep down, an immense simulation model. History being that thing that grasps concepts, that grasps people, that grasps ideas, puts them into language, puts them into images that can then be consumed at a later date, does point to its simulation, does point to its uh, kind of simulacral effect. Now these simulation models present, especially the ones pertaining to news or history or something like that, or just our general condition of today, um, always contain within them the possibility of a kind of revolt. Now th this has often been taken up by Baudrillard as being uh, acts of terrorism, where terrorism is, for him, like, thank God terrorism exists, or as he says in Fatal Strategies, and I'm just going to paraphrase, uh, he fears not terrorism as much as he fears a state capable of eradicating it. So that state in that formulation being that kind of perfect system that is able to erase all negativity, all negation. So there are little uh, strategies against this system in the form of terrorism. But I think there are also the possibilities of more state-run oppositions to this, which is, I think, uh, one reason why we might see the development of some kind of fascist systems. Certainly things that are arising all over the world now that are trying to conceal or trying to, um, I guess, galvanize a kind of uh, national or cultural identity that can then become the reference, that can then become the kind of totalizing thing that stands opposed to the endless proliferation of everything and can then be said to be territorialized or in uh, the, it would speak to what uh, Simone Weil calls the need for roots in a sense not to say that she's an advocate for fascism or anything like that but there there is a similarity there so when he says at least in the video on YouTube with the title the year 2000 will not take place he is saying that we're speeding up to the point that the that as he says of history, the end, being the year 2000, is not going to occur. It's like we'll almost skip over it. Or, as he comes to expound upon in the next essay, it's almost like we've started to go backwards, right? Where there was uh, in the uh, infinite density of like the before the Big Bang, everything was coming together just before it would, it would explode out again. So we can see kind of the reverse happening. And that's what's, you know, one of the theories about the universe, right, is it, it's shrinking. It has expanded, proliferated to a point that it cannot reach, finally hits a barrier that it cannot reach or circumvent, and now has nowhere else to go but back. So this is how he, I'll move into the next chapter, that is the reversal of history. So of this, he says that, so this is not even the end of history. We are faced with a paradoxical process of reversal, a reversive effect of modernity, which having reached its speculative limit, and extrapolated all its virtual developments is disintegrating into its simple elements in a catastrophic process of recurrence and turbulence. So one such way we can think about that is a kind of uh, surreptitious, so a kind of hidden, a kind of sneaky re-territorialization, and I'm just using that term because it's convenient, uh, re-territorialization of all the things that we think, well not we think, but have been disappearing. So for example, uh, with pornography, a Baudrillardian might posit that that marks the end of sexuality. And I think they'd be right. It is it is uh, not a place where sexuality exists. It's a place where the simulation of it would exist. Or it's kind of perfect version. You know, perfect by whose standards. That's a whole other dis discussion and certainly one worth having. But for the sake of it here, you know, I'll skip over that. Uh, but, for, but what else is going on is that there is being instilled in this very system another kind of body, 
another kind of sexuality that comes to take place of the real. So we're still sticking with this kind of Baudrillardian logic that the real comes to be uh, simulation and the real are not opposites, right? They are very much the same thing, where certain things can come to be taken as real, even if they are simulations. So I think that's what he means when he says that we are kind of in this process of history or reaching the end of it. We have been steadily creating various points that we can cling to, even though they are simulated. So in the passage I just read, this comes out in the following form. It is disintegrating into its simple elements in a catastrophic process of recurrence and turbulence. So these are not steady points to grip, grip onto, but they are still things that, you know, that have some substance, be it simulation, simulated or not. So to this, he gives us a, an, an idea of what to do. Um, he says, <laughs> quite, it's funny. He says, the only way of escaping this, of breaking with this recession and obsession, would seem to be to set ourselves from the outset on a differential or on a different temporal orbit, to leapfrog our shadows, leapfrog the shadow of the century, to take an elliptical shortcut and pass beyond the end, not allowing it time to take place. So if we were able to do that, hypothetically surpass history, right, that would take us out of the always already present or the kind of spectral light of simulation and would then put us into a place where history was behind us once again, where sexuality was still something to be contemplated once again or anything like that. So, and again, I, I want to emphasize that this isn't a kind of accelerationism, rather it's a way in which by which we can ourselves propel beyond an accelerated system. So it's kind of extremely obscure and abstract. And what, you know, what that would actually look like is it would be impossible to crap out, not to say someone shouldn't try, uh, but that, you know, that's what he gives us here. So in the following chapter, he gives us something of an image of what that might look like. So he lays out a kind of uh, speculative, um, I'd, uh, stealth agency, he calls it. So the stealth agency would be responsible for reporting on what he calls unreal events. Now, it's unclear as to, not, um, as to whether or not these events actually occurred, but let's say they didn't, and they were fake events. So the role of this agency for Baudrillard then would be to um, set up against this simulation, that is the simulation of the world or our current situation, a radical de-simulation, or, in other words, to lift the veil on the fact of events not taking place. So in the current news cycles, it would seem absurd to question whether or not the events take place, because you, you see them in real time. At least when Baudrillard was writing, you know, he's making reference uh, subtly to like the Gulf War and all the kind of media footage that was going on around that, um, and how important that was for public knowledge about these events. So for Baudrillard, all of these events, any event simulated through news media, or, or any other media for that matter, is in itself a simulation. So what this organization or this agency would do by uh, reporting on unreal events, it would call into question the reality of the supposed other events. So if people were to consume those unreal events as though they were real, it would trouble the idea that anything presented on the news media or anything like that is real. So one such example, and I, this is just one that I like to think of, um, for those that are unfamiliar, there's a uh, program on YouTube called Marble Olympics, like marbles, Marble Olympics, where someone, I assume some guy, uh, puts marbles through these kinds of, of obstacle courses, right, and gets them to race or, or do other kinds of things, kind of Olympic style. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, wow, isn't that interesting? Like, it really, um, you know, makes a mockery of all things Olympics, right? Where in the Olympics, if you're from, you know, Brazil, you cheer for Brazil. If you're from the United States, you cheer for them. If you're from Canada, you cheer for them. And it's really quite random. And it's really quite um, strange that we do that. And we may very well just be choosing marbles of various colors and making them our team. It is no less, um, there's another word I'm looking for, it is no less 
another word for random that that's eluding me uh, it's no less random and it in very many ways by showing us the kind of unreal version of the olympics with the, with marbles that you know have no agency or autonomy right they have no cognition show us the absurdity of really engaging with olympics at all because all it is is a kind of blind willingness to go for any kind of team any kind that you know you just happen to share already arbitrarily set barriers with or, or borders with for people that you don't even know and probably will never know so and it's just one example how of of a kind of organization or a kind of effort to undermine the simu- simulation so what he how he frames this is as follows he says for the radical irony of our history is that things no longer really take place while nonetheless they seem to so what we see instead is actually a kind of reversibility so in the case of the news or the news media where one might be inclined to think that there are events that are displayed on the news what we actually see is the opposite where because we have a new because we have news we therefore have events events never occurred before the news events were not conceivable before the news there was what you experienced there wasn't something uh, as an event happening in real time or on repeat on cnn or fox or something like that or another example would be that uh, that he gives here is that um no longer is work predicated on production or sorry let me let me just read it um it is no longer work that serves the reproduction of capital but capital which produces and reproduces work a giant parody of the relations of production which i think is a very interesting way to put it and not to necessarily comment on whether or not uh, how marxist that is or non-marxist it is uh, it it does point to another key theme in baudrillard's work that is the idea of reversibility where there is no such thing as like a true place of power be it capillary in the Foucauldian sense, that is it kind of like a web or anything like that, because for Baudrillard, everything is reversible. There is no such thing as power being exerted on something else without another power being exerted back. So now I move into the third chapter, I think, or the fourth, whatever, the event strike. Uh, so now we're going to get into more of, you know, Baudrillard's disdain for this system. So drawing upon Arendt, he says that there was a time, or as Arendt in uh, The Human Condition correctly notes, uh, there was a time when people were obsessed with the possibility of immortality. So this would be a very symbolic immortality, or one of the, how she puts it, it's like there can, you know, Achilles can't exist today because Achilles was, um, you know, an, an example of excellence. Whereas today for Baudrillard, he says that we are obsessed with or what we seek now is not glory, but identity. Not an illusion, but on the contrary, an accumulation of proofs. Anything that can serve as evidence of a historical existence, which is you know one way we can regard things like social media that continually point to our being subjects, continually point to our being real um, active agents in the world. To which Baudrillard would say that is surely a symptom of a world that has gotten rid of the possibility of engaging as, you know, autonomous, real agents. So all events, those if we consider an event kind of a site for uh, the thing's aura, as Benamine talks about, or an event, a kind of real phenomenon, that is really uh, led us astray. Or as he says, events now have no more significance than their anticipated meaning their programming, and their broadcasting. Only this event strike, so a, like a strike, like a union strike, constitutes a true historical phenomenon. This refusal to signify whatever, or this capacity to signify anything at all. This is the true end of history, the true end of historical reason. But now this has got me thinking. If we can also think of the event strike as being like a, like a missile strike, almost like a kind of bombardment of the event. So I kind of leave that up to you to, to decide because the way he talks about it, it could almost be both because he sees, you know, both the end of the event and the proliferation or the bombardment of the event with the event strike. So in approaching the end, there is a great deal of fear uh, that many people 
deep down, they don't know they know it, but but it's there, at least according to Baudrillard, uh, where the question was once, and this is apparent in books like uh, The Transparency of Evil, when Baudrillard wonders what comes after the orgy. So the orgy being the metaphor for the kind of explosion of desire, the explosion of liberation. Baudrillard says that the question was once, what would come after it? Would it be a kind of cooling off or something like that? To which now he says quite funnily, funnily, he says that, no, what we will see will be an intermin- interminable cleanup of all the vicissitudes of modern history and its processes of liberation of peoples, sex, dreams, art, and the unconscious. In short, of all that makes up the orgy of our times, in, the a- in an atmosphere dominated by the apo- apocalyptic presentima, that all this is coming to an end. So then we see the emergence of various kind of fascist systems that try to, you know, ground the world before it disappears, to try and make sense of it before it vanishes. Hence our reliance on things like science or scientific reason or truth or anything like that um, as a response to this growing indifference, to this growing lack of connection to anything. And this comes out in many other places than the state. For instance, the whole drift of painting has withdrawn from the future and shifted towards the past. Present day art is currently reappropriating the arts of the distant, recent, or even contemporary past. Which points to just another of the many problematic things that deal with appropriation. The Western world loves a number of things, but especially it loves to be a tourist and it loves to to appropriate. That is to give the semblance of there being some kind of history to the West. That is not simply a you know a banal or to, you know when I speak of the West, let's talk about America because that's what Baudrillard really focuses on, or North America more generally. Um, we have a certain obsession with crafting an identity for ourselves, but because we don't have the capacity to do it of our own culture, we have to take from others, which just, you know, adds on to the other very many problematic things that are part of cultural appropriation. And what this then results in, it's just one of the consequences, and Baudrillard turns to Nietzsche for this one, is a very you know, expanded version of chassantiment, that idea of kind of self-hatred, the kind of resentment or hate for oneself that um, taking out of the genealogy of, m- of morality. And this is the point, as Baudrillard says, where it is as though history were rifling through its own dustbins and looking for redemption in the rubbish, where we are seeing at the end of history any attempt we can to kind of cling on to something because we are scared because we have a great deal of anxiety, a great deal of ressentiment for ourselves and the system we find ourselves in. So then what we come to do is recycle. And there's a kind of enigmatic phrase here. Uh, The problem is resolved by the postmodern invention of recycling and the incinerator. We shall not be spared the worst, that is. History will not come to an end. Since the leftovers, all the leftovers, the church, communism, ethnic groups, conflicts, ideologies, are infinitely recyclable. So they are kind of those things that we can always fall back on because they give us some kind of meaning, some kind of semblance of of meaning that is grounded. So now moving into the next uh, essay, the thawing of the East. So considering more this idea of appropriation or the kind of East-West divide. So he says that the West, for its part, is little more than a repository, or more accurately, a dumping ground for freedom and human rights. If ultra-freezing was the distinctive and negative mark of the Eastern world, the ultra-fluidity of our Western world is even more disreputable since, as a consequence of the liberation and liberalization of mores and opinions, the problem of liberty quite simply cannot be posed here any longer. It is virtually over and done with. In the West, freedom, the idea of freedom, has died a natural death. This is, this we have seen in all the recent commemorations. In the East, it was murdered. But there is no such thing as the perfect crime. It will be very interesting from an experimental point of view to see what freedom is like when it resurfaces. So by the East, he is referring to primarily Eastern Europe and Russia and the USSR. 
So in the West, we are ashamed of the horrors of the East, right? Where Western Europe looks down and the other Western countries look down on Eastern Europe as being that site of a kind of indeterminate, um, irresponsible, kind of inhuman uh, place, to which Baudrillard says that in a very Hegelian way, there is a necessity for these kinds of poles to exist. Now, whether or not the narrative pushed on the East is in fact true in any capacity, or if it is kind of an extension of the logic of Orientalism that someone like Aid or that Aid would describe, Said, sorry, Said would describe, Baudrillard says that we are in the process of wiping out the entire 20th century, effacing all the signs of the Cold War one by one. And what is more, he continues, the fact is that in, in a sort of enthusiastic work of mourning, we are in the process of retracting all the significant events of this century, of whitewashing it, as if everything that had taken place, revolutions, the divisions of the world, exterminations, the violent transnationality of states, nuclear cliffhanging, in short, history in its modern phase, were merely a hopeless imbroglio, and everyone had set about undoing that history with the same enthusiasm that had gone into making it. So this strategy is all a part of our trying to repent for the sins of history to some sense, in some way. So that brings us into the next chapter, the strategy of dissolution. So these examples of Eastern European countries, or what we are doing with them, uh, is a kind of repentance for our sins, right? A kind of driving of the world to a place of perfectibility, to a kind of uh, simulated world, if it hasn't already arrived there. Eastern European countries then are used as a kind of scapegoat for our own deterritorialization. They do serve the end of convincing us that there are still possible, you know, terrible things, which of course there are, but these are grounded ones. Whereas today, no such thing is really possible because we are found in a kind of postmodern situation where, as Baudrillard says, repent repentance is a part of postmodernity. And so by casting them in a negative light, we are in, uh, affirming the system that we, exi we, are, we ourselves exist in. So by saying that the enemy is over there, by saying that X, Y, and Z events to have occurred in the enemy's location or in the enemy's vicinity, because these things are bad, then therefore whatever stands opposed to that is good. Now this does not, or, and this is kind of a tricky idea, how we often position ourselves in relation to those things, notably being uh, consequences of communism, you know, socialism, of uh, racism, ethnic cleansing, anything like that, we align ourselves with them as though those things were still a problem for us. So we have moved beyond it and still appeal to it as though we have not. Now this serves the strategy of convincing the people over there and the people here that we are still somewhat grounded, that we are still exist within second uh, degree simulation where reality was. So therefore, as Baudrillard says, if the countries of Eastern Europe gain access to that economy, that is the market economy, they will be entering not the modern, but the postmodern era. So these European countries or Eastern European countries collapsed for Baudrillard not because of some kind of external influence or some kind of internal corruption, but rather they imploded on themselves. And then Baudrillard, you know, and for anyone who plans to read this or who has read this, would know it's extremely enigmatic and extremely confusing. But he says that that was almost a strategy employed by um, the Eastern countries so that they would not adopt the same kind of Western values. So he says that we should be very afraid being in the West, because if, it, if, if they were susceptible to that, then surely we are as well. To which I would say, we have found a way to inoculate ourselves or vaccinate to defend ourselves from it by propelling ourselves into space, where we are no longer grounded. We no longer have any kind of disposition towards inner collapse or towards implosion because we are in a perpetual state of exteriority, a kind of always becoming which is why Baudrillard is able to say, now that the problem of the wall is out of the way, we can see that it perhaps provided more protection for the West than for Eastern Europe. Now that the triumphal illusion of the West annexing the East for the greater glory of democracy, of course, has faded, we can sense that it might be the other way about, 
the East gobbling up the West by blackmailing it with poverty and human rights. And this pre- presents for us the problem of evil, where we believe beyond the wall there existed evil. That was for Baudir a kind of literal manifestation of evil. Whereas he says, at that, where, at that point it was visible, opaque, localized in the territories of the East. Now we have exercised it, liberated it, liquidated it. But has it, for all that, ceased to be evil? Not at all. It has become fluid, liquid, interstitial, viral, the transparency of evil. So this is not to say, and he makes this very clear, that evil is something we can see right through, something we can completely understand. Rather, it is uh, that it shows through in all things when they lose their image, their mirror, their reflection, their shadow, when they no longer offer any substance, distance, or resistance, when they become both imminent and elusive from an excess or fluidity of fluidity and luminosity. So thus, because we live in an age where we do all of these things, make everything hyper-real, hyper-apparent, evil exists everywhere, kind of transparency of evil, where an evil is the eradication, and he makes this uh, distinction somewhere, I can't remember where, but in the distinction between good and evil for Baudrillard, the idea of good is when there exists good and evil, when there can be conflict. Evil for Baudrillard is when there is only good, when there is only kind of perfectibility in a simulated form or, or any other kind. So then what do we do with the places where these things can't be said to exi- have existed, where the spaces on Earth have not imploded on themselves that have been indicative of the opposition to the West, notably the East. Well, for Baudrillard, they become theme parks, the kind of experiments of the world, the funny, uh, cutesy attempts at trying to gain a degree of autonomy outside of the global system, like Cuba, which he equates to may as well be Disneyland in relation to the Western gaze. Now, this next insight will feel kind of out of left field or going back a little bit uh, because, you know, it's it's tricky to stick with this in a uh, coherent way, even through my notes. Uh, The fall of communism serves something of a strategic purpose because it, where there was once a distinction to be made, where there was once a kind of antagonism or kind of Hegelian uh, possibility between the East and the West or between market economy or capitalism and communism, Baudrillard says that with the demise of communism will subsequently come with the demise of capitalism because one is wholly necessary for the other in a kind of Hegelian way. So another example he kind of alludes to is with computers, where what stands in opposition to computers would be the computer virus or the thing that threatens it, where if the computer virus would disappear, then computers would be allowed to proliferate endlessly, which would lead to a kind of catastrophic global demise, which would then see the, you know, the subsequent destruction of the computers themselves. Now the West, in becoming a kind of globalized system, having gotten rid of its adversary, uh, is then able to eradicate anything that stands opposed to it. But Baudrillard makes a distinction here where he says that it is quite impossible for the West to penetrate any other culture or any other kind of cultural paradigm. It can eradicate them, but it cannot get in it. That is because all cultures refuse the West, because the West is that non-zone. It doesn't have a culture. It has nothing to penetrate with. So it does so by colonial expedition. It does so by things like tourism, where it simply consumes the other, does not go into the other, whereas it is only possible for the other cultures to penetrate the West because it is a void, and a void does not have borders. A void can simply be uh, experienced by anyone who witnesses it and can then be uh, infiltrated or penetrated by anyone that uh, witnesses it. And this kind of global situation, this globalized West Westernness, marks an end to empires as they have been historically understood and instead gives birth to what Baudrillard calls micro uh, microsystems of slavery or the reign of slave microsystems, where it renders everything that stands opposed to its nothingness a slave to its very possibility, right? A slave for it to continue. So then we move into the next chapter, the Timisoria. I don't know how to pronounce that in Romanian. I don't 
no Romanian at all. Um, the Timisoara Massacre, which I'll just kind of gloss over because it's very much a repeat of the first sections considering about uh, consideration about news media and simulation, where this massacre, Baudrillard says, uh, was the faking of the dead, which aroused a kind of moral indignation and raised the problem of the scandal of disinformation, or rather the information itself as scandal. So this calling into question, you know, the reality of things presented on the news and how that disturbs, like with the secret agency that I brought up before, um, how it disturbs our relationship to things that are supposedly, supposedly, supposedly true that are presented on the news media. But something else that I will expand on in the very last bit of the uh, essay is when Baudrillard says that television inculcates indifference, distant skepticism, and unconditional apathy. Through the world's becoming image, it anesthetizes the imagination, provokes a sickened ab reaction, together with a surge of adrenaline which induces total disillusionment. Television and the media would render reality, le réel, dissuasive were it not already so, and this represents an absolute advance in the consciousness or the cynical unconscious of our age. So really, reading these kinds of lines brings out the um, kind of Baudrillardian pes- pessimism or cynicism that I think many people read in him, and they're probably right. I just, you know, there's there's also more to it than that. And then from here we move into another rather repetitive chapter, that is the illusion of war. So for those familiar with his discussion of the Gulf War, this is him just kind of expounding upon it. And as a kind of um, disclaimer, many of the things that I will go through, many of his next texts, uh, recycle some essays because there were different editors that collected various uh, different essays and put them in, in different volumes. So for that reason, if anything comes across that's like extremely repetitive, then I you know, do my best to kind of just skim through it and point to the direction where you'd find the originary material. So in the case of, of the war, to be quite quick about it, uh, it, was a, it was a media war fought on CNN, where uh, Paul Patton, I believe it was, in one of the introductions to one of his books, I believe it was the Gulf War book, says that there was a moment in the Gulf War where I believe it was CNN reporters went up to a bunch of soldiers and said, hey, you know what's going on here? to have the soldiers reply and say, we don't know, we're waiting to see on CNN, as though they had a closer relationship to the war uh, through the television than by their being physically there. And this is something that he brings up earlier in another book, but I will present it again because it's a really interesting idea. So the idea of simulation of war goes back quite far. In fact, we can see examples of it all the way back to the Greeks, where Baudrillard says that it was the simulacrum of Helen that was at the heart of the Trojan War. The Egyptian priest had held on to the original. We do not, do not know what became of it when she set out again with Paris for Troy. And I think the, the Greek word would be eidolon, E-I-D-O-L-O-N, standing, uh, which means idol. But even without the magic of the priests, Helen was in any case merely a simulacrum, since the universal form of beauty is as unreal as gold. The universal form of all commodities Every universal form is a simulacrum, since it is the simultaneous equivalent of all the others, something it is impossible for any real being to be. So of this, Baudrillard asks, what was the simulacrum in the Gulf War? So in the Trojan War, there was Helen, right? That was the simulacrum in that it was unreal. It was a kind of unreal standard in both like the sense of beauty and and um, kind of um, the ability to promote war in that capacity. Baudrillard asks, what was the Gulf War's Helen? What was the Gulf War's simulacrum? And he says quite bluntly, it says he says, it was a war itself that was a simulacrum. So it was a war conducted for war's sake to convince us that we haven't, you know, lost our connection to a thing called war, something that we have a very intimate connection with, where war, you know, thinking about like Deleuze and Guattari and a thousand plateaus, the war machine not synonymous with the act of war itself, but, you know, there is some similarity. The war machine is what moves things in in many ways. The war machine is what precedes the state. The war machine is what almost precedes anything. So the, the point of this war was to resurrect war 
as though war has not disappeared in a kind of sim simulation uh, or a kind of simulated space. So not just war, but other efforts to, to, at, at global kind of control are also on Baudrillard's radar. So the one that he focuses on, focuses on in the next chapter is cat catastrophe management, where we have an obsession, you know, our humanitarian obsession to go where there is conflict, as though the West is responsible for fixing the world. It takes that upon itself, right, without ever questioning why many terrible things are happening in the world, and it's very much predicated on the kind of Eurocentric notions pertaining to, you know, truth and and you know, religious validity or what is considered to be the real religion, all stemming from the West in many ways. Then capitalism, exploitation, in very many ways, all stemming from the West. So in order for the West to kind of um, absolve itself of guilt, it then takes on these kind of humanitarian efforts, right, to make sure that it doesn't feel bad about itself. But this serves a dual imperative, where it does, as I just mentioned, kind of makes ourselves feel good about ourselves. But it also does the following. Blood-sucking protection, humanitarian interference, médecins sans frontières, uh, doctors without borders, international solidarity, etc. The last phase of colonialism. The new sentimental order is merely the last form, the latest form of the new world order. Other people's destitution becomes our adventurous playground. So not only a strategy to make us feel good about ourselves, our being present with the conflict convinces us that you know we haven't entered a totally simulated sphere as though conflict were still possible and as though conflict were still to happen to those most privileged in uh in the west right where of course what we consider the west in a geographical sense you know is burdened by uh many tragedies many catastrophes but it doesn't seem to affect you know certain people which is why like, it seems as though the world would be indifferent to who gets affected by what, unless, of course, there was a kind of plan, a plan organized by certain people, not in a conspiratorial way, uh, by, but through a kind of cultural logic to maintain you know, power, authority, protection, comfort in the hands of a few. When these catastrophes disappear, however, and Baudrillard gives a very interesting hypothesis here, uh, when there are no more catastrophes for the West to run to, the West will be forced to produce its own catastrophe for itself. Now, all this kind of possibility is predicated on our understanding or on the West's understanding of themselves as being best, right? That the West is best kind of uh, dictum or kind of um, phrase. So to this, Baudrillard says that the underdeveloped, are only so by comparison with the Western system and its presumed success. In all light of its assumed failure, they are not underdeveloped. They are only so in terms of a dominant evolutionism which has always been the worst of colonial ideologies. So when thinking back to that self-destruction, if all catast other catastrophes go away, uh, we would be forced, or the West would be forced to self-destruct because it needs perpetual catastrophe to occur in other parts of the world in order for it to convince itself that it is the best. So if those catastrophes were to disappear, it would certainly call into question the West being best. And thus, because the West has such a firm connection to that ideology, would then disappear. Because if that ideology disappears, so too does the place or the map covering the territory. And I'm going to, again, sorry I have row kind of disjointed all this is, especially where I'm going to go to now. Uh, but then he th considers the way that fossils play a certain role in, in this whole scheme, schematic, where fossils or our obsession with digging up things from the past underground convinces us of, you know, reminds us of there being history, of there being a kind of past that points to our always already being historical or always already being real. So if modernity in its day gave rise to anthropological exploration, post-modernity, for its part, has spawned a positive craze for the Neolithic and the Paleolithic. The extraction of relics has become an industrial undertaking. So we do this because, he says, we are moving further and further away from our history, that we are avid for signs of the past. <laughs> 
and that once we actually find these signs of the past, we put them in museums, we put them in other display cases, and we do the same with other cultures that have died at our hands, uh, that we have killed off. Uh, we put their artifacts in museums in order to pay kind of homage to them, to kind of crystallize or freeze who they were or what they were. So in fact, their being discovered wrenches them instantly from their truth and secrecy to freeze them in the universe of museums where they are no longer either true nor false, but verified by scientific fetishism, which is an accessory to our fetishistic will to believe in them. So museums, and he uses another verb, to museumify, or to have been museumified, muse museified, I think in simulacrum simulation, is one way by which we perpetuate that system or that ideological practice. Ideological practice. Let's go with that. So in this whole process, we are, as he says, uh, in the following chapter, Maleficent Ecology, we are rendering the world a kind of waste bin. This is because things like the natural world, whatever that might mean, but what we can say safely are the zones of the world that are unneat, unclear, unsimulated, but still being part of simulation in the other simulated sense. So the natural world, Baudrillard tells us, is becoming residual, insignificant, an encumbrance and we do not know how to dispose of it. By producing highly centralized structures, highly developed urban industrial and technical systems, by remorselessly condensing down programs, functions, and models, we are transforming all the rest into waste, residues, useless relics. By putting the higher functions into orbit, we are transforming the planet itself into a waste product. Consequently, Baudrillard tells us man, human, uh, is cheerfully gambling with the destiny of his own species as he is with all of the others. That is, you know, all their species and all their peoples. That is because at the very will of the human, either by neglect or, you know, um, direct action, species are vanishing. Quite simply, we are destroying the world by our direct motivations by the simulated space in which we are crafting, which seems like a necessary consequence to the world of simulation we are constructing or we have constructed, because those other zones, the natural zones, the zones of other species that are indeterminate, do not fit within this narrative. Therefore, we submit them to the kind of test, and if they pass the simulated test, if they can be domesticated, you know, like cats and dogs or <laughs> anything like that, then they're fine. For those things that don't fit in so well, well, good luck. And funnily enough, this only really occurs because hum the human species itself has been domesticated through, Baudrillard says, our technologies, um, or yeah, just quite simply, our technologies are domesticating us. This presents for what Baudrillard calls biosphere two, which is in opposition to biosphere one, what he calls the whole of our planet and the cosmos. So being the kind of a real, if we can say such a thing existed. Biosphere two is the simulated real in relation to ecology, in relation to our relationship to the natural world or anything like that. So the real planet, that is biosphere one, presumed condemned is sacrificed in advance to the miniaturized air conditioned clone. Have no fear, all the Earth's climates are air conditioned here which is designed to vanquish death by total simulation. In days gone by, in days gone by, it was the dead who were embalmed for eternity. Today, it is the living we embalm alive in a state of survival or in a state of perpetual air conditioning. Kind of really Baudrillardian thing, you know, we, we become perfect, um, perfectly comfortable beings, which renders us docile, of course. And we find ourselves through this comfort in the glass coffin of biosphere 2 to which he says he hopes there would be some kind of catastrophe some kind of accident to wrest us out of this uh, this kind of numbness this kind of drip feed of total brave new world or hugsley and comfort and in this framework we become as the next chapter the title suggests immortal so immortality so no viruses, no germs, no scorpions. <laughs> I, th I remember when I first read that, I laughed so hard. Like, these are the things that threaten the human. Viruses, germs, scorpions, <laughs> and reproduction. Like, 
it's clear his phobia, how his phobia came through here. I'm not emph- it, it was fucking hysterical. Anyway, so no viruses, no germs, no scorpions, no reproduction. Everything is expurgated, idealized, immunized, immortalized by transparency, disincarnation, disinfection, and prophylaxis, exactly as in paradise. So whereas once, and this is going back to what Baudrillard uh, sees in Hannah Arendt, whereas immortality was once a kind of symbolic thing that would occur for people who attained a degree of excellence, now it is something that has been democratically realized. But of course, when I say that, there's a little asterisk saying that only people considered, you know, human, like still white European descendant males, uh, only get to experience this. So for that reason, it's it's kind of like a reversal of the old way that immortality was was achieved. Now it's a kind of banal thing. So therefore, and this is just one way that he's kind of starting to circle back to the beginning, there cannot be an end to immortality. The end will not occur. The year 2000 will not take place. Now this process is blurring the distinction, Baudrillard says, between what he calls the human and the inhuman. So the inhuman being that immortal, air-conditioned, totally comfortable being. Where at one, whereas one point, this kind of transition was prophesized by Nietzsche as to give us the, Nietzsche is just one example, to bring us into the domain of the superhuman or the ubaman, or I think that's the thing, the ubaman. Uh, Baudrillard says that we actually enter now into what he calls the era of the subhuman. So this subhuman, one of the characteristics of it is the disappearance of the very symbolic characters of its self. So this is important. So Baudrillard likes the symbolic in many ways. The symbolic is that which precedes oppressive simulation. It is also in that way has a connection to a term he expounds upon later and that is subsequently or that is consequent. God, this is also the title of this book, Illusion. So illusion and sim- the symbolic are things that Baudrillard applauds and kind of hopes it will be retained in this world. So seeing the disappearance of the symbolic with the subhuman really figures into this framework because the end of the symbolic would mean the end of what he calls contradiction, what he calls indeterminacy, what he calls mystery, what he calls illusion in favor of total operability, total functioning, perfectibility, organization, all these kind of bad terms. So that is one of the fundamental characteristics of the immortal subhuman. Or as he says, Generation by formulas, algebraic, or genetic has everywhere supplanted the play and destiny of forms, that is, the indeterminacy in favor of formulas. So when Baudrillard is talking about human, the human, he doesn't say there's ever been this kind of one human being. Human has, the human has never existed for Baudrillard. The only thing we can say is that in the pre-oppressive simulation era, the human was ambiguous. The human was indeterminate. The human the human was susceptible to flux and flow. Whereas in the simulated age, it is grounded. It is grounded through all our virtual technologies. So it becomes a human in this way. This stands opposed to the theses put forth by like Deleuze and, and Foucault, who say that the human is at risk of disappearing. Whereas Baudrillard says, no, the human only really comes about in this age. And this then resonates with the uh, Nietzschean idea of the vital illusion that Baudrillard clings on to, which I'll expand upon more when I actually get to that book titled The Vital Illusion. But the vital illusion is the ne- necessity of there to be some degree of illusion in the world. You know, the play of appearances that is always with us, that we can't, nor should we want to, exercise or conjure away. So another insight he gives us is that in relation to this topic of immortality, what we see is the removal of death which is very problematic for him because that is one of the constitutive elements of being human to some extent because death is also the ambiguous indeterminate end of a human which posits the indeterminacy of the whole life process so he relates this to the holocaust where what was taken from people was not necessarily their lives but their deaths where they had no control over their death it became something that they were just put into like they Death was just something that occurred on a mass scale without anyone's consent over it at all. So then what do we do? And this brings us into the next chapter. How can you jump over your shadow when you no longer have one? Well, 
how do you overcome this thing called immortality or the other the technological things that point to this thing called immortality or try to maintain it now to this whole problem of this chapter he obviously doesn't give us a whole answer you know this is him rethinking through many of the problems that we are presented with in this age where our only task is to kind of move beyond right where but how do you do that how do you jump over your own shadow if you're existing in the spectral light of of simulation or reality where light is all around you where you're all present your shadow no longer exists so rather than giving us any kind of solution he's really laying out the problem even more deeply one other way that he frames it and i find this to be a good analysis he says that this loss of the shadow in a sense can be is mirrored with the kind of loss of otherness so instead of otherness we have things like difference a kind of democratic rendering of the other into uh, a kind of liberal understanding of you know very um, alterity in some ways so if we get rid of otherness how do you then reconcile the other it's, it's a very difficult problem because the only way we know how to actually do it is by instilling more difference because that's our only relationship to the other is through its having become different the same thing applies to the shadow where we know a shadow is created by light but if we think that we can we can only attain the shadow by bringing in more light what we are actually doing is getting rid of shadows getting rid of the possibility of shadows because if you're standing in a room with light all around you where is your shadow going to exist it's not going to be anywhere so our task then is to consider the possibility of subtraction or our ability to somehow transcend the light or transcend that which is you know giving us the possibility for the other or giving us the possibility for a shadow that has in its proliferation eradicated that possibility so this moves us very well into the next chapter ex exponential instability or exponential stability so he says that in the kind of um historical linearity of time or the teleological aspect of history it is impossible to conceive of an end the end is in fact only conceivable in a logical order of a causality and continuity so this paradox is produced by the fact that in non a non-linear non-euclidean space of history the end cannot be located sorry i, I mix those up so it's when, when it's non-linear spending too much time doing this today when it's non-linear then we don't have the possibility of gauging the end so our systems then Baudrillard tells us work to simultaneously maintain stability and instability so there has to be some degree of stability maintained and this is similar to the ways in which it happens with like pornography where sexuality is kind of maintained as a as a stable point and then is also destabilized by its endless proliferation so we there's a necessity to keep both or in the case of history a kind of linear dimension and a non-linear dimension lest one take over completely now moving into the last chapter i know i've kind of sped up but i've really sifted through all the repetitive stuff um and because i don't want this to go on too long so hysteresis of the millennium what we see here he says is a kind of a retroactive version of history and all our ideas philosophies and mental techniques so we may perhaps even see this as an adventure since the disappearance of the end is in itself an original situation this is an important point because there are throughout Baudrillard's work kind of glimpses of uh, an optimism like of there being a possibility so even with the end of history as he says here this is a kind of new phenomenon like how interesting what mysteries does this entail or what possibility does this allow for and the end of something is really quite interesting for him because without the end what he really fears is that we'll just enter a total phase of banality where he says that the end of history the end of the political the end of the social none of these things is actually going to happen instead we're just going to kind of thaw out with these systems until an eventual kind of fading away where there won't be any kind of magnificent or fantastical end it'll just be a kind of you know like a little flame going out nothing exciting which would be quite boring for him and this is a point that comes out more in some of his other texts his later ones like the um uh, vital illusion that he expands upon this a little more so it's in that 
Yeah, and we enter really at this in this phase, what he says, or in this very way, we enter beyond history, upon pure fiction, upon the illusion of the world. The illusion of our history opens onto the greatly more radical illusion of the world. Which is, again, his kind of maintenance of history, or maintenance of the world as being something possibly that can never be totally operationalized, that can never be totally fully understood or simulated. Which is important to consider. So when he's talking about the illusion of the end, we can take that title in a few different ways where we burden ourselves with the possibility of a kind of end, right? The end that comes about through kind of catastrophic ends or through a kind of simulated uh, fading away, to which Baudrillard says that that's not going to happen. Like we, we live in a world that is much more clever than we are and we live in a world that is much more capable of keeping itself and ourselves going than we can imagine. Because illusion, like seduction, can never be fully removed. So that, I guess that's it here. Um, it's a good a good read. A lot of interesting insights. Uh, if you're looking for a book that has more of like a, a coherent linear path, it's not the best because that's not what he's doing. Uh, but with that being said, like it it, it signals a kind of late Baudrillard, and many people like to divide him into two parts. You know, there's the early Baudrillard up to like seduction, and then the late Baudrillard. I don't, I don't like to do any such thing. I think that there's a, he's very consistent across time, even if his ideas get a little bit more performative. Uh, the form does change, but the content I think is pretty similar. Of course, there can be distinctions drawn, but anyways. For anyone, yeah, that checked it out, I hope that there was something useful here. If not, tell me why. I'd like to get better. Um, but yeah, if anything else, you know how to leave it.